1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The called out ones, ecclesia, a congregation, the people of God assembled for the purpose of God. So what is that purpose? To declare his faithfulness, to strengthen hope, to equip and engage each other to do the work of ministry, to encourage each other by gathering more and more, to have complete unity in Christ. But how is this possible if we're so different from each other? Well, that is where the beauty lies. The world tries to weaponize our differences, but the Holy Spirit synchronizes those differences and creates unity and builds up the body of Christ. We are unique, but we are not autonomous. We are meant to do this together in the power of the Holy Spirit. God desires a charismatic body. This is the church defined. I'm sitting here at Yorba Linda Regional Park. I'm at the baseball field. Whenever I get to a baseball field, it's a little bit of PTSD of uh, something that happened when I was a kid. Now, I was in Little League when I was about seven or eight years old, and I wasn't very good at baseball. In fact, I wasn't good at anything involving a ball. I'm just not good at sports. I'm still not good at sports. I think because I'm a musician, and if you're a musician, there's a law written in the heart of man that you're not allowed to be good at sports and a good musician. Now, maybe there are exceptions to that rule, but what I'm trying to tell you right now is that if you know someone that is an exception to that rule, they're not a good musician, maybe. But all that aside, I was not a very good baseball player. And so I was always kind of like last up to bat, you know, it's like, oh, no more damage can be done, send out Raymond. And so I remember I never hit the ball. And so my parents to incentivize me came to me and said, if you could just hit the ball once and get on base, we will buy you a new bike. I was like, that's all I need to know. And so went to the batting cages, got ready. So time came, coach called me. He said, Raymond, you're up to bat. So I grabbed my bat, my oversized helmet. And I started walking up to, and I'm trembling. I'm like, I, I got to hit the ball. Like the fate of my new bike depends on it. And so I remember I get to the base, I swing, strike one. I'm getting a little bit more nervous. And I, I, I'm picture, I could see the bike like descending from the heavens. And so I get up there and I'm with all my might. I swing and all I hear is crack. And that's all I needed to hear. Threw the bat, hit an old lady. No, I didn't do that. And uh, started running. And all I know is I was running as fast as my legs could carry me. And so running, 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 my heart's pounding. I feel it, I'm gonna get my bike, I'm gonna get my bike, I'm gonna get my bike. And I hit first base and as my foot hits the base, I hear the umpire say, foul ball. And I'm like, ah. So then I grab the, the bat, walk back over, because the foul ball is actually a strike, so I had two strikes on me. And then I strike out. And that was pretty much the end of my baseball career until today. The, the problem was my parents didn't buy me the bike because they said technically I didn't get on base. I, sh I mean, I hit the, the ball, I hit the base, but it was a foul ball. And so I was pretty sad. So I walked back to the dugout and I'm feeling terrible about myself until my coach comes up to me and says, that was amazing. I'm like, amazing. Like I, I struck out because no, I have never seen anyone run so fast. I was like, well, it's the bike, man. I'm going to get the bike. He said, no, you are the fastest runner on this team. That was, that was a good job. In fact, I want you to be our substitute runner for anybody who's injured or is unable to run. You're going to be my guy. And for the rest of the season, that's who I was. If there was a player who hurt his ankle, I got to run for him. And then I felt like I was a vital part of the team. I felt like the worst player until I found out that I'm the fastest runner. Now, some of you might be out there thinking, well, that's how I feel when I go to church. I see a lot of people with a lot of charisma 
I see a lot of people with a lot of talent, serving the Lord, thriving in it. People are paying attention to them. It seems like the hand of the Lord is on those folks. And I feel like I'm just the worst player. I belong back there on the bench. Well, I might caution you to think, maybe you feel that way because you haven't figured out that you're the fastest runner. We're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're gonna look at spiritual gifts. Where do spiritual gifts come from? What is charisma? What has God placed in your heart to desire to bless the body with your gifts? And so each person, each Christian who is filled with the Holy Spirit is given a spiritual gift. In fact, each person is given access to spiritual gifts. And so we're gonna unpack that here tonight. Charismatic, defined. It's an adjective. Number one, exercising a compelling charm which inspires devotion in others. Number two, it's a grace gift. So we're gonna see how you can fit in to the body of Christ for the benefit of the body of Christ by learning about spiritual gifts. So we're gonna do that by going to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're gonna start in verse four and it says this, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. That's very important for later. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So that's important. It's not just for your benefit, it's for the benefit of each other. Now, it says three things there. Gifts, services, and activities. There are gifts, services, and activities, but it's all under the umbrella of the same spirit or the same God. We need to kind of decode the mysticism to the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's kind of the, the God that is the lesser known God, but he is no less God. And so who is the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't have time to get into an entire theology about the Holy Spirit, but it is important for you to know that when you are saved, when you repent from your sins and you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit enters you and has a role in the life of the believer. And so the primary role of the Holy Spirit is to teach you, is to teach you. And so John 14, uh, 25 says, but when the Father, this is Jesus talking, when the Father sends the advocate, as my representative that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. And so as we're reading the word as believers, the Holy Spirit is really our teacher. It's helping us to understand and then bringing to mind what we've already learned. Uh, the second role of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify you or set you apart for holiness. Paul writes to the church uh, in Rome there in Romans chapter 15, verses 15 to 16. He says, even so, I have been bold enough to write you about some of these points, knowing that you all need this reminder. For by God's grace, I am a special messenger of Jesus Christ to you Gentiles. So Paul's making it clear here, I'm not your teacher, I'm not your sanctifier, I'm your special messenger. Uh, I'm merely carrying you the message. For by God's grace, I am a special messenger of Jesus Christ to you Gentiles. I bring to you the good news that I might present you as an acceptable offering, this is the important part, made holy by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is, is sanctifying you is making you more and more like Christ, making you more and more holy. And then finally, the third rule is to empower you. Now, some of us might look at the Holy Spirit and think, that is the only role for the Holy Spirit, is to empower me and to give me great power. Um, but here's the thing, you shouldn't desire great power over great piety. If there's a desire in your heart, it should be for great piety. It's to be more holy. It's to be more like Christ in your character and your walk. Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that those with unveiled faces can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. 
and we are transformed more into his image as we go from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. And so we should desire great piety over great power. Uh, yes, the Holy Spirit is the source of power, but that isn't the only thing the Holy Spirit is the source of. You can't become more pious before you become more obedient. You know, Jesus says in John 14, 15, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so God's love language isn't a powerful, charismatic person. It is an obedient person. Okay, so now we're going to look at the spiritual gifts. And I'm going to break it down into three categories. Or sorry, three kinds and two categories. I'm breaking it down into three kinds and two categories. And so here's the three kinds. There are discerning gifts. There are declarative gifts. And there are dynamic gifts. Discerning gifts, declarative gifts, and dynamic gifts. So the discerning gifts. This is a confusing one for a lot of people because I think a lot of people will think that they have the spiritual gift of discernment when in actuality they probably have the spiritual gift of criticism. Somebody said, you know, God's giving me the spiritual gift of discernment. I don't like that guy so much. I have something about that guy that I don't like. If you want discernment, it is always available to you through the wisdom of God's word. Discernment is not a result of a God-breathed gift. Gift. It is a result of the God-breathed word. And so what are the discerning gifts? Well, one of them is a word of knowledge. And basically that is to know something without knowing it by natural means. Pastor Bob has a great story about how he met Becky and came to realize that he was the one that was supposed to marry her. God gave him a special word of knowledge. There's also a word of wisdom. Uh, and so that would be a divine answer to a solution or a particular event. Beyond just the years of wisdom and experiences, uh, the Holy Spirit can give you a special word of wisdom. And then there is the discerning of spirits. And I think most people camp out here when they think they have the gift of discernment, but they actually are meaning to say, I have the ability to discern spirits. And that's to be made aware of a presence that is d demonic. Uh, we know in James, he talks about different types of faith, that we have dynamic faith, we have dead faith, and we have demonic faith. And so there are Christians among us that have dead faith. And so the Holy Spirit gives us an opportunity to operate within that gifting to, to understand who those people are. So those are the discerning gifts. I know I'm moving through them quickly, but we don't have a lot of time. The next is the declarative gifts. Declarative gifts. And so it's prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. People generally get confused about prophecy. We, we tend to confuse prophecy with fortune telling, right? It's like, that guy's a prophet. He, he knew who was going to win the big game or whatever. Uh, but it's actually this. It's a, a message of encouragement from God to a person or group of people. And it always brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to others. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. You're basically speaking on behalf of God. In fact, later, uh, Paul encourages the church and says, look, if you should desire any spiritual gift above anything, you should desire to prophesy. So when you're reading God's word and encouraging others with it or exhorting others with it, you are operating in the gift of prophecy. And since everyone is encouraged to desire it, everyone has the opportunity to do it. You know, the prophets were essentially just speaking on behalf of God. So that's prophecy. Then there's the gift of tongues. And this one becomes a little bit controversial depending on which side of the spectrum or where you fall on the spectrum of charismania. But it's a message from God in a language unknown to the person who is speaking it. Uh, and then it, it comes to the benefit of that the people you're speaking it to and the gospel. Uh, we see a great example of this in Acts chapter 2. In fact, it's the first spiritual gift we see uh, the disciples operating within. And so you see tongues of fire and then mighty rushing wind. And then it says the people were amazed because they, they heard uh, the disciples speaking in their own language. And so God endowed them. The Holy Spirit filled them with the power to share the gospel in the language that could be understood. And so it's kind of a twofold. It's an actual language. And then it is also a spiritual language. Again, we don't have 
time to unpack each and every one of these, but um, I can give you some resources if you want to dive deeper. Then there's the interpretation of tongues. Uh, that's understanding and expressing the thought and intent of a message in tongues. And the important thing to remember here, it is an interpretation, not a direct translation. That's an, an important thing too. Um, again, we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but if you look at Acts chapter two, you see it's a beautiful thing. The declarative gifts are on display. Speaking in tongues, being able to speak in a language unknown to those people for the benefit of the gospel. And then Peter steps up and prophesies. He speaks on behalf of God for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of those people. And th over 3,000 people get saved. Beautiful thing. Finally is the dynamic gifts. So these are faith, the gift of healings, and the working of miracles. Faith, the gift of healing, and the working of miracles. So faith, not to be confused with saving faith. I like to call it serving faith. Because saving faith is you believed on Christ that he is the propitiation for sin. He's risen from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. That's, that's your saving faith to say, I believe in Jesus. But your serving faith is different. It's a supernatural impartation of belief and confidence for a, a specific situation. So we see, uh, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, they call that the hall of faith. This is the kind of faith that they're talking about. Uh, we, we see Noah who believes that God's gonna send rain and begins to build an ark. And uh, I saw a meme the other day, it was kind of silly. It said, uh, Noah was the original conspiracy theorist. I'm like, well, since conspiracy theories are made up in your head, I, God literally told him it was gonna rain. And so he had the faith to go and do uh, what God told him to do. And uh, we see Abram and Sarah, hey, you're gonna have a baby. 99 years old, yeah, no problem. They had a baby. And then you, you can go and read the Hall of Faith there in Hebrews chapter 11. So it's a supernatural impartation of belief. Uh, the gift of healings is a supernatural endowment of d divine health. I've literally seen this in my own life uh, without getting too much into it. I grew up with tremendous amounts of hearing loss and to, to a point where I was wearing hearing aids and I continually prayed for God to heal me and thank God that he did uh, because now I am a music minister. I minister through music and you kind of need your hearing for that. And I don't like to tell too many people that story because then it gives them the opportunity to go, hey, you're a pretty good musician for you know a deaf guy. Anyway, so then there is the working of miracles. The working of miracles is a divine intervention that alters our natural circumstances. A divine intervention that alters our natural circumstances. And uh, I believe God still does miracles today because he has not changed and he is a miraculous God. And if you wanna see miracles, and you're not seeing miracles, maybe the thing to do is to run into situations that will take a miracle for you to accomplish. I, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of missionaries overseas going into impossible situations and God working a miracle. I've seen it in, in my own life that through this process of foster and, and adoption, I've seen just incredible miracles happen, things that I know that only God could do, only could be divine intervention. If we continue to read, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11 through 18, it says, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into the one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one members, but many. You see what he's doing here? It's not just for you, it's for many. With great power comes great responsibility as we're seeing here in a second. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, uh, would that make it any less part of the body? No, and if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, does that make it any less part of the body? Well, no. If the whole body were an eye, uh, where would it be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members, important verse right here, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. So no matter how good the ear does at hearing, it's not gonna be promoted to an eye, right? Because 
It was created with a unique purpose to here. Just because God has gifted you in one area, it doesn't mean that he won't empower you in another area. But I do want to caution you on the other spectrum of it. Because if you're not careful, the first thing that you're great at will become the only thing you're good for. The first thing you're great at will become the only thing you're good for. If you find great success in the power of the Holy Spirit in, in certain areas of the church body, our proclivity might be to, hey, I'm just going to live here. I'm good at this. This is what I'm good. I'm great at this. So this is all that I'm good for. You can't find your identity in your spiritual gift. You shouldn't find your identity in your spiritual gift. Your, your identity should come from Christ. Sometimes we might go to the church and we'll be like, well, so-and-so is singing so beautifully. They've been gifted with that. Or man, he preaches and teaches so beautifully. And that is, that that's the gift. And, and he's at the front of the line and I'm just kind of the bench guy. He's the great batter. I'm just the guy that I haven't figured out that I can run yet. There is no front of the line, only a front line. The church is not a competition. It's a community. We're not standing in line. It's not like, oh, I'm at the back of the line and maybe one day I'll get up to be able to teach or maybe one day I'll have a gift of healing or maybe one day I'll have this or that. Or the other. All I have is, no, 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 no. We are holding the line together. The gifts that you're given are for the benefit of the body. And, and the sooner you figure out how to use those to benefit the body, uh, the better. And so you might be like, yeah, but I'm, I'm not a good teacher. Well, good. Because we, as we just learned, the Holy Spirit is. Well, I'm not wise enough to counsel anyone. I, I can't, you know, help anybody in their marriage. Or I can't help anybody. Off. It's like, well, James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. And, and God will give it without reproach. You have access to wisdom. The Holy Spirit gives you access to that. Uh, I can't work miracles. Yeah, that's true. But the Holy Spirit can you know, in John 14, 12, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that Jesus is talking, the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be the father. I saw a news report of a father who was so filled with adrenaline that he was able to lift a car off his three-year-old little boy. And not only did he lift the car off the boy, he lifted the car 10 inches off the ground. Now, it would be foolish to think that that guy has been training to lift cars 10 inches off the ground. It was his adrenal glands that released the adrenaline for him to be able to do this. He's not always just walking around tossing cars around, although he might try now, but he had the energy and power to do it. And so just as ad adrenaline comes from our adrenal glands, which is already inside of us, our spiritual gifts come from the Holy Spirit who is dwelling inside of us as well. And so as we close, I wanna ask you a question. Do you think that you have charisma? Do you think that you have charisma? Now, we distort this word because we see politicians with all their flashiness and saying, oh, that guy's got charisma, or that, that actor over there's got charisma, that guy who's preaching, he's got charisma, gravitas. That's not what charisma is. If you break it down in the Greek, charisma means this. Charis, grace, gift. Charisma is a grace gift. And so, I'm gonna give you three questions to ask yourself to really decide, do you have charisma? First question is this, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you have the adrenal glands in you? Number two, do you step up to bat even when you've never touched a base? Do you still step up to bat even though you've never touched a base? You know, interesting thing is Babe Ruth was considered, according to the Sandlot, the greatest base player, ball player that ever lived. He hit a ton of home runs, but Babe Ruth was also the strikeout king. He swung at everything. And so maybe it's time for you to get up to bait, to get up the bat and just start swinging to figure out where your sweet spot is. Number three, are you seeking opportunities that require miraculous outcomes? Are you seeking opportunities that require miraculous outcomes? Check this out. A bar of iron about that big costs about $100 to buy. Just not very expensive, right? But if you turn that iron bar into horseshoes, the value of that iron bar has now become $250. If you turn that iron bar into sewing needles, the value of that iron bar becomes $70,000. If you were to take expertise and turn that into watch springs, now that $100 iron bar 
becomes worth $6 million in revenue. Your value is not in what you are made of. It's in what God makes of you. Psalm 103, 14 says, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we were dust. If you remember in Genesis, he formed us from the dust and breathed his breath into us. God breathed his spirit into the dust to form mankind's body. And now he's breathing that same spirit into you to form his body. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. And so you might be desiring to be a Babe Ruth and figuring out that you're a Raymond Gregory. You might feel like the worst player, but now maybe it's time for you to figure out that you're the fastest runner.